Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin. You can find our website at www.rce-cast.com. You can subscribe, find the RSS feed, and submit requests for other shows. I have with me my uh, get co-host, Jeff Squire from Cisco and the Open MPI Project. Good morning, Brock. Morning, Jeff. And today we have with us two people who work with um, the HDF5 file. Uh, we're not exactly sure exactly what it does and what you'd call a file, a file format or what, but I have with me um, Mike Falk. Hi. And Quincy. Hello. Quincy, I think Brock was being a little too polite there. He's, he wasn't entirely sure how to pronounce your last name. Quincy, could you, could you say that for us? Sure. Quincy Coziol. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys, for taking some time with us. Uh, so, quickly, where are you guys located? Uh, we're located in Champaign, Illinois. We're at the research park uh, that's part of the University of Illinois. So are you guys affiliated with uh, NCSA down there also or not? Not uh, officially anymore. We still do work with them. We have a contract with them. Uh, we started out uh, as a group at NCSA, and we were there for 18 years. Um, and then we spun off as a nonprofit company whose mission is to uh, s- sustain and support HDF technologies. Okay. Uh, before we go further, though, um, can you guys give us a quick rundown on what is HDF? Uh, yeah. Um, so HDF is actually several things. Um, we talk about the HDF suite of technologies, and by that we mean um, file format and then software uh, library that allows one to access data in the format, and then uh, various tools, some of which we've developed, and then those others. Uh, there are actually two HDFs. The original HDF was developed in 19 first, first 1987, uh, and implemented uh, at NCSA with a variety of um, really visualization tools and it was always open source and it kind of caught on and went through several generations uh, until the fourth generation which we now call HDF4. Uh, By that time it was uh, widely used um, all over the world, but in particular the NASA Earth Observing System was using it, um, and that was sort of our bread and butter project. Uh, Then, by that time, that was, uh, what, 10 years we'd been in existence almost, we realized that there were a lot of things we could do better. the Accelerated Strategic Computing Initiative project came along, which was out of the um, DOE weapons labs. And they came to us looking for a standard format that was scalable and could handle you know, the kinds of data that they were dealing with. Uh, and uh, we said, well, you know, we're ready to start over. So we invented HDF5, which was really part of the ideas we had from the original HDF, but also a number of ideas that came out of the labs and other users and lessons learned and so forth. So HDF5 was uh, developed over a couple of years, originally released in 1998. And I think we really think of that as the flagship HDF at this point. Um, HDF4 is still very widely used. Um, by those projects that adopted it in the 90s, um, and in particular, the NASA Earth Observing System. So it's still there, but the real growth is with HDF5, and we really think that it's the product that everybody ought to be using. For those who haven't used HDF before, um, what, what exactly does HDF stand for? 
Oh, hierarchical data format. So does it actually, is it a freeform format or is it a, it's like, this is the way the file is laid out? Uh, it's a very freeform format. Uh, the original idea was we didn't know what kinds of data people would be wanting to exchange and share. The real motivation at the NCSA, which is the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, was that we had a variety of different computing platforms uh, that scientists were using, and they wanted to be able to move their data seamlessly from one platform to another um, in an architecture-independent way. So they might have some data that was on a big Indian machine, some other data on a Cray, some other data on a, you know, a PC, a Mac, and so forth. Um, and so we developed this format that describes how the data is, is laid out. Um, and then we developed a software that can convert from one architecture to another. So it's really designed to be an architecture independent format. At the same time, we were developing it for scientists. So scalability, uh, the ability to deal with complexity, um, the ability to run efficiently on a lot of different platforms, those were all very important principles that we were trying to address. Uh, so that's, that's where that came from. The hierarchical aspect of it came from the idea that we wanted to be able to um, store a variety of objects and to be organize, able to organize them in ways that were meaningful to an application. So uh, the original idea was that it would be a hierarchy. Uh, in fact, HDF, an HDF file is not necessarily a strict hierarchy. It can be any graph structure. But we did have this idea that you'll have what we call a group, which would be like a node in a graph, uh, links, which would be like the branches in the graph, and then objects, which could be um, nodes, or what we call data sets, and that's where the actual data go. So you can think of an HDF file as a container um, that has a user-defined internal structure for organizing objects. The data sets themselves support a rich variety of data sets, a uh, data types, I'm sorry. Um, a data set itself is essentially an array, one dimensional, two dimensional, you know, n dimensional array. Uh, and you can pretty much store anything inside a data set you wanted to. So, for example, if you wanted to encapsulate uh, a PDF file in HDF, you could store that as a byte stream, um, associate attributes with it that explains that it's a PDF file, so forth. Um, if you wanted to store a uh, finite element mesh, uh, you could store that, say, as a big regular grid or an array. Uh, so the idea was that you wanted to have a really rich set of data types and then the ability to just describe uh, those data types um, and describe the, the sort of aggregate or array that um, stored those data types. <laughs> Okay, so let me let me let me uh, ask some clarifying questions here. So it sounds like you've uh, you know as part of the suite of of tools and, and products that you've got there, uh, at least part of it is an is an API um, that you would uh, you know compile and link into your application and and call functions that store and retrieve data out of out of HDF files. Is, is that an accurate characterization? Yeah, sure, definitely. Uh, okay. There's some. Uh 
APIs, uh, the core API is written in C, and we've got um, languages and bindings built on top of that, and then tools that layer up on top of that as well. Okay, and so, and at least part of the target audience here is the scientist or engineer who doesn't really want to screw around with the, you know, the bits and bytes and how this stuff is stored, but they want to be able to write data from a Spark, for example, and then read it on uh, an x86 machine where the Endians are different. So the files are kind of self-describing in themselves that uh, when I write an integer value 7, there's enough data you know, stored behind the scenes that when I, you know, if I write that on a Spark and, and read that on an x86 machine, I'll actually get a value 7 on that x86 machine, even though the internal data representation between these two machines is different. Is that also accurate? Yes, that's definitely true. Uh, we, we designed the format and the interfaces uh, so that people could exchange their data and have um, easily translated binary formats like that um, exchange well between the, the different platforms. Okay, yeah. and I would imagine that, that since these files are, are self-described, that kind of leads into all the other tools in your suite. So you can say, oh, well, you know, I can tell that what's coming up here is, is 27 integers, and I can perhaps visualize that in, in an interesting way. Is that kind of what your, your tools do, too? Yeah, I think so. Um, we have uh, a, at least a tool, a good tool for browsing and some visualization aspects of HDF5, although we tend to leave that out to some of the third-party tools like MATLAB and IDL. Um, but the general goal is to have uh, at least the, the low-level structures self-describing enough that people can browse into them and go, oh, look, it's an array of 27 integers. But what does that mean to them may be one of the, the more difficult things occasionally. They have to come up with a data model that says, oh, that data set is supposed to be interpreted like this. Right, right, okay. All right, and so and 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 you're also hitting on another what I would assume is a key point too that this stuff, the actual file formats are well documented so that third parties can write tools. You mentioned you know MATLAB right there too, so uh, you know they could just read the file and actually act on it within their MATLAB scripts. That's the goal. Uh, it's not always the case that they're well described. Uh, so that's one of the things that we work a lot on with our users is to make sure that, uh, for example, within a group, um, they all agree on how they're going to organize their data in HDF5. Uh, so, yeah, that is a challenge. Right. The syntax is self-describing, but the semantics are challenging and, and need a good community data model to, to really make them meaningful to that community. I see what you're saying. So even even if you have a, a file that's nicely self-described, if if I'm expecting to read in 27 integers, but there's actually three doubles there, then we've got a problem, right? Yep, definitely. Okay. Another random question um, that that occurred to me while I was listening to your descriptions there. Um, so we heard similar things from the Hadoop guys that they say we're very good at unstructured data. You know, we put stuff in files, and, and it can be retrieved any old way later. How are, are you comparable to Hadoop, or is that an entirely different thing? Or am I talking apples and oranges, or, or are there similarities here, or what? There, there's probably some similarities, but I, I have a, and I haven't done an enormous amount of background on, on Hadoop, but um, it seems to me like Hadoop is a little more from the database model of things. We've got these tables and records in them, and it may be a little more unstructured than that. It's kind of bags with key value pairs. Um, but we, we have a lot more arrayness to the, the data uh, in our data sets. It's, it's a particular structure that is more science and engineering oriented than Hadoop's kind of random, we can put anything in here thing. Does that make any sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I did some, uh, but before the show, I did some screwing around with HDF5, and it was quite neat. There was a little command that came with the core product called um, H5LS and H5Dump, mm -hmm. and it really is just like there's the root group slash, and then you can have groups that, um, Mike was describing them as like nodes on a graph and stuff, but for me being a sysadmin, it looked very much like the Unix file system. I had a group that I could put data sets in that looked like files, and the group looked like a folder, and but it was all internal, and they included extra information like were they doubles, 
how many dimensions they were. So if I wrote a three-dimensional array, it remained a three-dimensional array with very little work, and it was very easy to write. I was quite happy with how easy it was. Yep, you've discovered the, the secret handshake. Um, that's we, we tell people, uh, we don't lead off with, this is a file system, um, but functionally inside, it's a file system. It even had from Unix there. Yep. Interesting. What, what was the motivation for that kind of design? Uh, well, it was it was well known. Um, it was a nice hierarchical design. Um, it mapped well to some of the products and projects that we were working on, and it uh, I just there was a lot of experience and, and and knowledge to draw from in the file system design community, and it and we could specialize it enough into the science and engineering zone that it, it seemed to work pretty well. Okay, in terms of what you were supporting, you said the core language was written in C, but you had bindings for others. I noticed the core package had um, Fortran and a C++ um, setup. Is there anything else out there? There was something I ran across called PY Tables. It, do you support some of these other languages? Do you support COBOL? <laughs> That's dangerous, yes. Uh, no, but we have an Ada wrapper uh, that we know about. Well, there you uh, go. Uh, we have uh, Java bindings that we produce in-house and some prototype uh, .NET wrappers for things uh, that are very experimental right now. We, we do support the Java stuff, but not the .NETs. Uh, there's Python. One of the wrappers uh, that's out there is the PyTables one, and another one is called H5Py. And there's Ruby bindings, Perl bindings. Lots of people have come along and said, gosh, that's cool. Let's go write a binding for it because the HDF group guys haven't done it yet. Uh, but we support basically our C, C++, Fortran, and Java for now. So a question about your bindings there. Are, are they kind of a one-to-one -one mapping to your C bindings, or do you try and have them take advantage of language features, or you know, how, do you, how do you manage that stuff? Uh, yes. <laughs> Some, we, we, we try to make them as native as possible. Um, so... But the, the ones that are third party, we don't have any control over. You know, you, you get what you get. Um, for our cases, the C++ is somewhat or object oriented. It's pretty reasonable and class oriented. The Fortran is very Fortran-y. Um, Java has good object model behind it as well. So we try to be very native to the, the particular language and not not just write wrappers. Sometimes we end up having that. Our, our .NET um, wrappers are just that. They're just plain old wrappers and they don't have any object model to them. But uh, the best thing to do is generally to write the object model and let the native programmers feel at home in that uh, interface. Yeah, and okay. I should add that there's been a lot of interest from the community uh, on high-level language uh, access to HDF. So the H5Pi is an example of that. And uh, we actually have a little wiki that we set up to discuss how we might create certain uh, C APIs that would bind better with the sort of high-level view of HDF. Um, and that's a direction we're trying to move into because we feel that if we can make it really look natural to a Perl or a Ruby or Python programmer, um, it'll make HDF accessible to a much wider uh, audience or group of potential users. Okay, and, and you keep referring to, to community here. Is, is HDF open source? Yes, it is. What, what license do you guys use? A BSD type of license. Okay. And um, so is this uh, truly, a, you know, an open source collaborative kind of development or are you guys, you know, 90 percent of the development accepting patches? Uh, how, how do you guys work, work the project and work with the community? Um, this has been a challenging place for us. We've been it's a funny, specialized product, right? Uh, so we'd like to have more community involvement. But at the same time, I think over the course of our. 12 years or so on HDF5, we've accepted a total of three patches from users. Um, <laughs> well, <there you> go. <laughs> so we have lots of people using it, but not many people really want to walk in there and get involved in 250,000 lines of library source code. Um, 
So we, we're definitely out there, but people have to kind of pick up the ball. So right now we do 99% of the development. Um, we f seek funding through contracts and grants and other uh, mechanisms and then uh, basically take those in the directions that the customers from the grants and contracts want or we have some internal funding that we try to apply in directions we think are you know, best for the total HDF5 community. You guys do support contracts as well? Uh, yes, we do. Yeah, in fact, that's a lot of where our bread and butter comes from. Uh, so we had the uh, visit visualization on here uh, on this show a while ago, and uh, they supported many different file formats. And so in my exploration in just one week of using HDF5, the freeformness something that was actually really, really nice. But like in visit, they'll say, okay, we support Flash, who we've had on this show, and we support uh, all these other different formats. And it turns out those files are all using, they're actually HDF5 files. But like you said, they're, they're internally, the actual data model for that project could, could be completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that um, sometimes our support contracts work in that direction as we, we say, oh, this community really wants to use HDF5 for storing their data, but they, they need to come up with standards for how they're going to structure their groups and data sets or what attributes they're going to apply on them. And then it comes out as like, well, that's a, say, flash HDF5 file. Um, and then whatever visualization tool has to be... Uh, kind of cognizant of that data model in order to do something meaningful with the data that it uh, supplies. Yeah, and one other thing in my quick little, you know, one week of screwing around with it, the <laughs> I.O. I could do from HDF5 was actually higher performing than the stuff I could write low level. <laughs> um, so oh. I, was, I was quite happy with that. Yeah, it's a special time machine technology, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the wonders of middleware, right? I mean, that's, that's exactly the goal for... Being able to encapsulate, you know, specific types of expertise into stuff that you, the the developer, don't have to worry about. I mean, that's kind of it's kind of the goal. I mean, I'm an MPI guy, and we do that kind of stuff for networking. And it sounds like these guys do that stuff for file storage. That absolutely is. You, you've hit on, I think, what our really one of our strongest selling points is, and I think your point is right. It's it's because it's middleware. We try to do things that other folks would have to do on their own, and we do it for them. So, um, yeah, that's right. An example of this is right now we're um, just starting a project in the bioinformatics area. Um, and this is a community that in the last oh, two or three years has seen an increase in the uh, amount and complexity of data, particularly the amount of several orders of magnitude. And their existing file formats and technologies for managing that data is just breaking down under the weight. Um, HDF already has the ability to deal with a lot of the problems that they would themselves have to create solutions for. So in this project, we're looking for ways to adapt um, HDF to handle that specific kind of data. And it's actually going very quickly and very well. So it's a good example of that. Well, cool. Let me, let me ask something uh, along my natural bias. You know, we've already mentioned I'm an MPI guy here. So uh, how, do, how does HDF5, do you guys interact with MPI at all? Do you use the parallel I.O. streams, or how does that stuff work? Right. We do, and we've been, um, we've been using MPI almost before it was certain that MPI would survive. Um, that was one of the baseline questions was, should we try this crazy MPI thing? I don't know if it's going to stick around. <laughs> um, but yeah, we we do have uh, support for uh, collective and um, independent I/O within HDF5 uh, for doing large data writes to the data sets, and uh, we do a lot of uh, coordination with some of the Department of Energy labs and other large national uh, labs in order to um, 
try to get our performance uh, and all the other aspects, the ease of use, um, really optimized for the for their users. Okay, now what what does that mean? So, are are you plugged into the back of uh, MPI file read and write, or do you actually use MPI technology yourself so that you can parallelize what HDF does? So, are you on the front end or the back end? I guess is kind of what I'm asking. Uh, we definitely need to be on the front end. We we want to leverage MPI to the the maximum extent we can. We don't actually write any networking code. We don't do any parallel file system I/O directly intentionally occasionally when there's a badly performant uh, mpi implementation on some particular hpc platform we have to get in there and then start tweaking with uh, mpi info and other sort of little hints to the uh, file system in order to get things working better but by and large we try to say use mpi make mpi faster and better and we'll take advantage of that you guys have on your website uh this got me going really really quick and it goes everywhere from the very basic open a file um do do most people learn that way or is there a full manual is that all available or you guys give training or uh we do give we we do give training i would say most people start out by working with the tutorial welcome any feedback that we can get on them um usually uh that's the way you have, tries a few things out. They're looking for a solution of some sort. Um, and then uh, when they really get into the nitty-gritty of the problem, then it may be a good time for them to contact us, and then we can come out and do a specific training, uh, consulting. As Quincy was talking about earlier, we really like to work with people who are haven't yet decided how they're going to use HDF, you know, specifically. Uh, So we help them kind of come up with a data model. Uh, Very often, for example, last week, Quincy and a couple of others were out at a Navy project where they have uh, how many, several different groups doing, four different groups, and they're all doing different kinds of things, but their data needs to be integrated. Uh, some are doing simulations, or some are actually doing measurements, and others doing other things. Others are connecting uh, probably HDF data with some database somewhere. Uh, and by working with sort of us as people who know HDF um, and trying to pull out of them what their use cases are, what their needs are, what their performance issues are, we kind of are able as a team to come up with the best kind of HDF solution to whatever their problem is. So that's that's kind of the way it works. I would guess, and we have no way of really measuring this, but I'd guess that 90% of the HDF users we never hear from have no idea what they're doing, uh, but that's open source. Yeah, we, we have exactly the same problem in the Open MPI project. I get asked this a lot. How many people are using Open MPI? It's really hard to yeah. say. I can tell you how many downloads there have been. That's that's about it. <laughs> what's the uh, largest store of data you're aware of? Like, what's the what's the most number of terabytes you know somebody has data sitting around in HDF format? Probably the Earth Observing System. <clears throat> They've got online about four petabytes. Uh, they've collected more than that, but they don't keep it all online. Um, there may be larger ones. Well, the earthquake people do terabyte simulations at a time, don't they? Yeah, so the largest single object we know about um, is um, Southern California Earthquake Center. Um has a terabyte sized simulations that they do. So they'll have one image that's a terabyte in size. Uh, and that's actually a, a very good example, I think, of the flexibility and power of HDF in, in terms of bringing solutions to, say, an existing problem. They have, they, I don't know, came to us maybe three or four years ago, and they had these images 
that consisted of, so your one image consisted of 900 separate files, okay? So uh, conceptually, it was just one great big, actually there's a three-dimensional uh, image. Uh, and if a scientist ever wanted to, say, access some part of that image, they'd have to figure out, okay, which file contains the data that I'm interested in? What is the data type of that data? Uh, so how can I go in and pull out exactly the data that I wanted from the various files, put it back together, convert it to the Indianness of my machine, um, and then maybe do something with it? Uh, with HDF, uh, we were able to overlay HDF. One of the things we didn't mention earlier is that an HDF file is not necessarily a single file. A, a data set within an HDF file could actually have pieces that are in a lot of different other files. So we would create a data set that sits on top of these 900 files and looks to the application through HDF just like a big array. And they could say, okay, I want this subset from this array, and I want it in, you know, 32-bit float. Uh, and HDF would do all the work for it. So it, it's that kind of thing where HDF, its scalability, and its sort of uh, ability to provide a view that's meaningful to an application is is uh, really valuable. Let me ask. You I, I also want to mention, since we're talking about big things, uh, the electron microscopy community is working with us now, and it's actually probably broadening to biomedical imaging generally. But they're looking towards images that are going to be 1.6 terabytes in the next year or two. Uh, so that's where size really matters. Cool. Let me ask you a little bit of a technical question here. You, you were talking about how the, the different back ends, you know, it's, it's transparent to the user. They're just doing, you know, HDF reads and writes and so on. How do you, how do you actually write on the back end? Do you just use the normal POSIX read and write system calls, or is there more, more magic underneath? I mean, do you have special kernel drivers, or are you just using basically whatever the, the file system is beneath you? Um, well, in a lot of times, uh, we try to reside over a um, portable layer underneath us. So most of the time, it's actually a POSIX file system underneath us. Um, occasionally, it's MPI or something else. But we, we really try to abstract out the hardware to the extent we can. We leverage it, but we try not to depend on it for um, everything. So uh, there's a lot of extensions. So there's some new POSIX I.O. extensions I'd really like to take advantage of. And if more people would uh, standardize those and use them, then we could actually start using them in HDF5. But a lot of our speed is th either through MPI or some aggressive caching and other special technology inside the library. So when you were saying the file sizes um, were like 1.6 terabytes, there's actually no, like, that's far from the limit that HDF will actually support, right? Oh, yeah, we can go. Um, we support a, a basically, well, the file format um, is currently um, uh, written to use 64-bit offsets and everything. and um, But the file format is actually, it's got knobs in there. We can tweak it out to, I don't remember what the exact upper limit. I think it was 8 to the 256th power, uh, whatever that is. Um, file size without changing this file format significantly. So exabytes now, you know, exabytes of exabytes someday. Okay, so size is, size is not an issue. Should not be. <laughs> so what is the relationship between uh, HDF5 and NetCDF? I know they were two separate things, but I see now that NetCDF supports HDF5. Can you kind of clarify those two projects? Yeah, the two projects started out approximately at the same time in the in the late 80s, um, and NetCDF actually 
um, came originally from NASA, something called CDF, a common data format. And that CDF was an attempt to make it platform independent. And what that meant was a network common data format. That's where the net came from. Um, and their approach was a little bit different from ours. And we were really working, um, you know, in parallel universes in a sense. Um, they came directly from the atmospheric sciences community, and they developed a format. Um, and uh, the same idea that, you know, the format would be something that the user wouldn't think about or worry about, but rather they would work through a library and an API, uh, and then there would be tools. Um, and their users, which were, it was really sponsored by the University Consortium for Atmospheric Research, which is an NSF-sponsored uh, consortium, um, wanted to think about their data in the way that they generally thought about it, which was that you have some sort of um, coordinate space and you define the, um, the coordinate variables or the dimensions within that coordinate space. For example, you might have latitude, longitude, and altitude. Um, and then all of your data, uh, which they would call variables, which would, we would call just data sets or arrays, would be defined within that context. Um, so NetCDF had a, had a fairly well-defined view of the data and the variables and the aggregates. Um, and at the same time with HDF, what we were doing was listening to scientists from all sorts of different places and they didn't want to be locked into a particular type of view. Some said, well, I just want to throw a thousand images into a file and make an animation. And others might say, well, I want to make a, you know, a triangle mesh of some sort, visualization people or something like that. So um, we didn't define, um, we didn't define coordinate spaces or anything like that within HDF. But not too surprisingly, the two formats had a lot in common. You know, they dealt with, they tried to deal with things that were fairly large. They tried to deal with the ability to go in and, and subset, take regions out of things, store lots of images, and, and so forth. Um, and over the years, um, we talked, and at one point, actually in the early 90s, we talked about maybe merging our two formats, but they were just so different that we really couldn't, couldn't make that happen. Our users, you know, we had different sets of users. Um, and then, um, towards the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, um, our emphasis, particularly with HDF5, on uh, scalability and our ability to handle very large numbers of things and uh, very large objects, um, as well as uh, we had built in um, the ability built in to compress objects. Um, and we had some of the filters and the kinds of things that Quincy's talked about. Um, the ability to, to interface with MPIIO was actually a, a, a big thing. Um, we got back together and we talked about maybe the next generation of NetCDF sticking with a very similar data model that they had always used, but having HDF5 uh, under the hood, underneath. Um, and it's the same thing that, that we were talking about earlier that I think Brock mentioned, that that's the idea of middleware. It does things for you so you don't have to do them themselves. So. Um, that would mean that the new version of NetCDF, if it sat on top of HDF5, it would still look to the users like NetCDF, but underneath they could say, gee, I'd like to compress my data, or I'd like to use collective I.O. Um, in this particular parallel system. Um, and so that's, we got together, wrote a proposal to, national, to uh, NASA, um, and uh, they funded um, uh, what we called a merge of NetCDF and HDF5. It's not really a merge, um, but in the process, uh, the NetCDF folks took advantage of some things that were outside of their data model. Um, for example, the group structure. 
the idea that you can create um, you know, hierarchies and other kinds of graph structures. Now, the way they use groups is somewhat limited, um, and that's actually, in, in my opinion, one of the, one of the real beauties of, of NetCDF is they have a very clean, simple model. So uh, we were talking earlier about how a tool might open HDF and have no idea what was in there because things were just a jumble of stuff. Well, from the NetCDF point of view, um, things have to adhere to that model fairly, fairly strictly. And uh, so if your data matches that model, makes sense with that model, then NetCDF is, is really the kind of interface that one should be using. Uh, and from our perspective, it's just, just another uh, data model that sits on top of HDF5. Um, so does that, does that explain sort of the, the differences and the similarities? Yeah, no, uh, that that definitely covers it, that they're trying to do something that's very specific to their group, and you were very generic, so they are now using HDF5 to provide all that lower level. Mm-hmm. Let me ask a question in a slightly different direction here. Um, what's your, your favorite or your the most unexpected or, or kind of the fun the most fun use you've seen of HDF5, maybe not even necessarily for scientific code or something, you know, just completely that you would not have have anticipated, perhaps. Yeah. Quincy and I were talking about this earlier and I was saying, you know, that's a great question. And I'm sure I'm going to come up with better answers uh, tomorrow and the next day because it's just a really neat thing to think about. The first thing that came to the mind to mind for me was um, we we were hearing from this group in New Zealand. Uh, these funny people with this funny Weta name. Yeah. <laughs> and we finally asked them what they were doing with HDF and said, well, we're, we're making this movie called uh, based on Lord of the Rings, and we're using HDF to uh, simulate a fog in the, in the movie. <laughs> and we thought that was Oh, really wow. Good. Is that the, the Hunt for Golem movie? Uh, no, it was the very first one. I think it was, at least they were sending us bug reports as they were working on the first parts of things. Oh, it was the actual movie, not, not the, 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 the oh, fan yeah. created movie. No, no. Wow, very good. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of, a, one of our favorites. Quincy, do you have some? Well, I mentioned this earlier when we were talking, but some guy in oh. Sweden, I think it was, had, was sending us these other, other end of questions like, how can I make my files smaller and make the software just a little bit lighter weight? And we're trying to help him out, and he says eventually, he says, well, see, I've got this cell phone application, and I'm really trying to store some pictures and images that I'm recording off my cell phone in your, using your software on the phone. And cool. that was a bit weird, too. <laughs> did, did he end up doing it? Uh, is, that, is, that so. some, is that a product now? I've questions okay. when we fix bugs eventually, and he's like, okay, you know, by the way. Wow. Well, open source. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. As as a as a developer myself, I have the I have a standard question that I have to ask all other software projects. What version <laughs> control uh, software do you guys use? Uh, yeah. We use uh, we use Subversion, um, which we we transitioned off CVS three years ago or so um, because it was really very limiting. And um, actually, I wanted to uh, pass along a thanks to you and the other parts of the OPN MPI team because we just blatantly stole. Your release methodology document. Um, <laughs> Excellent. And I'm um, uh, based our uh, kind of reworking how we're going to do our release methodology on some of the ideas you have there. So uh, there's some trade off in the open source community as well. Oh no, that's great. Uh, I'm I'm glad that you found it useful. Uh, again, <laughs> using uh, using other people's projects for things that were completely unexpected. Uh, that's that's great. That's what this stuff is for. It is. Yeah. Okay, guys. So we're going to go ahead and wrap it up now. Uh, where um, is the best place for people to get information on HDF and where can they download it? You have like a website or a mailing list or how, how can they get a hold of you? Um, yeah, uh, hdfgroup.org. That's the website. Um, and then we have uh, uh, a help desk with an email address. Uh, that's just help at hdfgroup.org. Um, and then there's a forum, a HDF forum. Let's see, how do we sign up? Well, I would go into the website and find the right user support link there. And there's there's links to get done to the mailing lists as well as download stuff and get over to the wiki and all kinds of different stuff, yeah. mainly from there. But that's the easiest entry point. Okay, and is the mailing right. list the best way to get uh, 
get involved with the project, like if you did have like like a quick patch for like a, a found bug or something. Just go through the mailing. You want to be patch number four for you know HDMI. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, top ten. <laughs> I want to say a little bit about that. I mean, uh, when when we spun off from the university, you know, we had no idea what it meant to, to start a company, especially a nonprofit company, and and so forth. And, but but one of our 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 real you know strong desires, and, and it's really a part of our mission, is to make our company uh, strong enough and stable enough. Um, that we can have the extra resources to engage the wiser community in it in a, more effectively than we've been able to do. You know, we've kind of had our heads down doing our job, just trying to survive. But um, as as we become, I think, more fiscally sound, we do want to try to encourage greater community involvement in things like, well, everything, but patches, for example, and, and those sorts of things. But those take a, a fair amount of resources just to manage, uh, particularly since um, many of our users really need this product to be very robust and very heavily tested. Uh, so if we do take a patch, it has to be somebody who's willing to do a lot of testing and, um, and adhere to a lot of requirements. So I just wanted to throw that in. Yeah, there's a reason why we've only accepted three patches. So. Understood. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry. Wasn't trying to be snide there. I well, no, 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 no. It wasn't taking difficulty of of taking a patch from the wild. You know, works for me is is not always the the best reason. But sometimes you do get unexpected little you know per, gems in the rough. Oh, absolutely. That's great stuff. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, guys, for taking some time out with us. Um, if you have any questions, you know, just please let us know. Um, this will be ready soon. Okay, great. great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having Appreciate us. Appreciate your time, guys. Thank you. No problem. Bye-bye. Bye.